Fresh Air Open House. A convo with the best electronic artists swinging through Adelaide. Fresh 92.7 and you featuring Pendulum. Welcome to uh, something I'm very, very excited for and that everyone at Fresh is very, very excited to present to you guys. Our Fresh Air Open House with Pendulum. Hi there. They call me El Hornet. <laughs> I call me El Hornet, actually. <laughs> Well, El Hornet, you are representing the, the Pendulum brand here in South Australia in the first show in like seven, seven. years. I, it, uh, it went really quick, but it took a long time. How does it feel to be playing shows in Australia again? Um, terrifying. I used to always say Australia was the hardest place on earth to play because you couldn't come and just kind of just meander through a set. It had to be like the best set you've ever done because Australians were so in tune with what was good and what was not good. So we kind of left it alone for a while because, um, I don't know, when we said we were coming off the road and not playing any more live shows, everyone was like, they've broken up. And we were like, we're doing a gig tonight. We haven't broken up. We're just not playing live. <laughs> and that happened on Triple J here. So we said, fuck, I guess we just won't play shows for a while in Australia. And in the last seven years, I've done two. Other wow. Than, other than this tour, we, I went and did one in Darwin and I figured, ah, it's Darwin. No one will know. <laughs> so I did a festival with The Living End and The Amity Affliction and I DJ'd between those two, which was crazy. And um, then we did New Year's Eve in Perth, uh, just gone, as all three of us, which was the first time back in Perth for, I don't know, since before I had a beard. Yeah, ages. How long ago was that? I'm curious, because this is impressive. I've had this beard since I was nine. Uh, <laughs> No, I haven't. I'm 24 <laughs> and I can't grow one, so oh, I'm this in is, awe. This is definitely a 24-year-old beard, <laughs> at least. No, I think um, it was, you know, we kind of um, left Australia alone because I figure that uh, we'd done the live show here so many times and it got to a level and we always felt like we were kind of regressing if we went down a step, so left home alone for a while. And we live in Europe, so it was kind of quite far to come. But um, I've got to say, I really missed playing shows in Australia. I've done... I think uh, seven shows in the last six nights and it's been so good. Like there's clubs in places I didn't even know existed. Any, like Wollongong, Central Coast, Cairns. Cairns as a club was like 3,000 cap and it was full. That's huge. And I said it was a backpackers and I was like, oh man, I'm planning a backpackers. Our career <laughs> is over. And I turn up and there's a liner APA and like LED curtains and 3,000 people and I was like, yeah, right. Just the most lit. It was, um, I guess... <laughs> it was literally on fire. It was so lit. That is huge. Uh, what was, um, I guess, the reasoning to do a regional tour as opposed to capital cities for this one? Um, I, I, I call Perth the bush, and I guess Adelaide has a bush-esque vibe about it where you'd see tours come and they'd say, Australian tour, and they'd go to Melbourne and Sydney and I'd be like, get fucked. <laughs> uh, it's so frustrating. And I remember like growing up in, in the bush in Perth and I even grew up in, out in the country. So many things didn't come to Perth. And I thought, why go to these places we've been to before five or six times? Why not go to Central Coast? Why not go to Wollongong? Um, but it was a bit of a catch-22 because then you turn up to venues and people are like, we can't believe you're here. And every time they say that, I'm like, should I not be? Like... <laughs> I thought it was fine, but no, the t it was really um, quite inspirational to actually get out and play some of those smaller places because um, they said they didn't believe that we were actually coming until they looked on our social media and saw me gobbing about it and said, oh, it's actually true. Like, I didn't like the fact that they didn't believe that we were coming, so now I want to sort of pursue that some more and... You know, I'm not going to rock into Port Pirie next week and do a set or anything, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice to sort of play some smaller places, definitely. I think um, it is just that feeling of having to pinch ourselves that we're actually getting a bit of recognition because even in Adelaide, we feel that a lot. It's always the East Coast state. So I'm glad that you get yeah. that. Well, Adelaide, you used to get tours that Perth didn't because we were over the Nullarbor and they would be like, it's going to cost us X amount of yeah. money to get there. I remember I, I was going to drive to Adelaide to watch Slayer play because they never came to Perth and four of us got into my 1975 Kingswood got 100 k's towards Adelaide and it broke down and we were like, well, Shit. not seeing Slayer. You know, 30 hour drive. It was like, you guys got some gigs that we didn't do. So I kind of feel the, that, um, that hatred towards you sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight being a, a DJ set, I know you care pretty deeply about, I guess, the art form of DJing and the actual skills that go into that. Yeah. What do you think are the qualities that a truly great DJ needs to have? I just don't think you should plan your sets. And I don't think you should, um, I don't know, just 
there's cheap shots in DJing. You know tunes that are cheap. You know you're going to get a reaction from them and it's an easy sell. Um, I just, I think you can avoid that. You don't have to do that all the time. And I think there's probably um, a lot that's kind of been lost in terms for looking for music that people might not know rather than just playing music that's safe that people do know. I feel that with Pendulum, I walk a pretty fine line with that. And some of the stuff that I do play is like universes away from what we've produced. And I do sort of get a little bit carried away and go on a little deep neuro funk section. And I'm like, hang on, this is just for me. But that was the point of DJing initially. It was for you. If they, if the people that came to watch you play, they, they were there to hear what you were into. They weren't there to hear me play Bombs Away because it, they make them happy or whatever. Like, I want to play the shit I like. If you like it as well, then we had a good night, you know. And I feel like we've kind of lost track of that a little bit. In I was about to ask, does that still hold true DJing now? Because there's, I guess, certain expectations attached to this, a pendulum DJ There set. is, yeah. I, that's what I say. I do, I sort of, um, a little from column A and B. I'm not foolish enough to know that, um, that, to think that I can't play those tunes that we made that people like to hear. And I'm super proud of every single song we made, so I'm not going to avoid them in favour of playing something obscure and weird just to kind of be a purist, but... I feel like it's filling in the gaps with things that might make people walk away and go, I didn't know what that was, hadn't heard that before, how do I find out what that is? Because that sums up my entire life as a rover and a clubber, going to clubs and going, what the fuck is this music? Where do I find it? Like, you know, pre-internet, like, go to a record store and ask the dude, hey, it goes like this, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> try and hum a tune. And, you know, now you can, like, Shazam stuff and figure it out. But I quite, I quite like that, um, that middle ground between playing the pendulum bangers, which everyone knows, and seeing uh, what's it, what I can put between them and, you know, sort of educate a little bit. So, I uh, mentioned before that you grew up in the bush, Perth, um, and you guys relocated over to London quite early in your careers, uh, and I guess was the reason behind that um, to get closer in touch with the DMB scene and with the community? It made sense to kind of base ourselves where it was all going on. Um, it was early days of, inf of, of uh, internet, so you, I don't even think there was an MP3 shop that existed before then. So we kind of thought, we need to go and put ourselves right in the middle of it, be where the label is that we've signed to, mm -hmm. be able to do those gigs that I used to read about on forums and stuff and think, you know, how do, uh, one day I'd love to go to those. And I thought if, I, if we stayed in Perth, it would have been, it kind of would have um, stopped our career from going anywhere, I think. Um, it was pretty scary though, like... You know, I left with like three hundred dollars, and then literally got there, and I was like, "How much is a pie?" It's three hundred dollars. I was like, "Shit!" <laughs> like those those first few years were really sketchy for Pendulum, and um, I don't know. One day, if we ever talk about that, it'll it'll probably surprise people how hard it was to actually leave Perth and have no security whatsoever, like, and go and live in England to do that. But I felt it was very important to do, um, especially with drum and bass. You know, you can be an outsider, but then you are if you turn up there and you know ingrain you like get yourself right in the middle of the scene as it was then was such an important thing to do so no regrets how important was that scene and that sense of community uh in those early stages of of your career i think at the time it was it was incredibly important because um even though they you know people in the uk drum and bass scene would say oh man it's a global thing like fine it was but it was very london based and they were even a little bit um against people who are from outside of london let alone outside from the uk so it kind of took the internet cracking it open and it took some of some people like Pendulum and uh, later on, I guess, Shock One and then a lot of the Eastern European guys making drum and bass to make the UK go, oh, wait, it's not just about us. But at, the, at that time, it was imperative. We had to be there. No other choice. So as you guys have grown, um, you know, over the years, Pendulum have really broken quite a lot of rules in terms of sound and, and what you're supposed to, I guess, do with drum and bass. Uh, so, I guess, what do you think the pendulum sound is and what drives that? No one told us what the rules were. So, we were making our interpretation of, of, of that music. And um, the reason why we were doing that is because we weren't from the UK and we weren't looking up to UK DJs as people we wanted to be. Most of the UK kids grow up being ravers and going and buying tape packs and, you know, listening to... I won't even say names, but all these top billing UK DJs and that's what they want to be like. Well, I wanted to be like a drum and bass DJ that made songs that sounded like Mastodon. You know, something that was completely outside the realm of anything that had influenced drum and bass before because that's what we were into. And, um, yeah, I mean, it worked in the end, but it was a bit weird at times when people 
who are very ingrained in the UK sound are like, what is this nonsense that you've made? And I was like, that nonsense went platinum, suck it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a sort of arrogance about it as well because we were like, we're going to take this mould and we're going to take all these other things that we like and chuck it in, which historically was drum and bass. It was influenced from every style of music. So it made perfect sense to us and no sense whatsoever to other people. But here we are. Was there ever a time where you were concerned that, um, I guess, going against the grain a little bit would, would come back to haunt you? Or was it always just... Got a bit of hate. I mean, you get hate. Hate is good because people are paying attention then. So I, I was concerned in, in the, uh, to, you know, in it, only that I didn't want to offend people I respected. But then that's inevitable sometimes. So you just have to be worried about yourself rather than what people think about what you're doing. If you, make, if you sit there and make music and try and shape your career in a direction that your peers will approve of, you'll probably plateau pretty quickly and you'll just be the same as everyone else. So we decided not to do that. We were having a conversation just before this started where you kind of brought up some of those similar ideas in terms of, um, I guess, friends and people you know and, and yes men. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I guess, you know. Music industry is full of, <laughs> the music industry is full of yes men. There was, a, there was a catchphrase that I was mentioning earlier and you'd send someone a tune on the internet and say, this is my new tune. And if someone said, yeah, it's cool, I would delete it. I'd be like, oh, fuck, tune sucks. Everyone doesn't want to offend you and they don't want to actually tell you truthfully what it's like or... or um, will kind of give you constructive advice because they think that maybe that's going over a line. And um, coming to England as an Australian, I managed to offend everyone <laughs> with the brutal honesty you grow up with taking for granted. What's this like? Shit. Why does it do that? And they'd be like, <gasps> and someone wouldn't talk to me for six months. I'd be like, what did I do? So <laughs> the yes men element in, in music industry was pretty, um, pretty heavy back then. And um, I, I kind of got myself in a bit of bit of trouble not being like that. But I think it's important. You've got to be honest. So when you're making music, how important is that constructive criticism to you? And do you hit up other people, uh, you know, your friends, your peers, for opinions? Not anymore, no. No? You used to. What's uh, made Just you... never felt that it was actually... Unless you were sending it to someone who you think can produce comparable music to what you've made, which is so arrogant, but it's so true. Like, if you send it to someone that can't make a tune as good as the tunes you can make, what's the point? Like, they might say it's great, but you're like, do you, do you know that it's great? Because it's such scientific sort of way of producing now. It might sound good on their iPhone, but in a club system it might completely fall flat unless someone's got i used to not send um, tunes to people unless i knew they had studio monitors to listen to them on i'd be like unless you've got the right speakers you can't have this demo which is so mental but that's it's it's science you know it's music and it's science and and electronic music requires that kind of level of critique so it's a bit scary but yeah not real personal but you know had to be like that so Imagining that there's some kind of weird time machine shit going on and you could go back and uh, chat to El Horner out in the bush in Perth, his first time to make tunes, what's one lesson you would give to him? What's the one thing that you've learned over the years that you're like, I wish I knew that when I started? Shit. Um, that's an awesome question. I have no answer. <laughs> um, I think I mellowed with age. I was a bit of a dick when I was younger, so... I'd be like, don't be a dick, be cool. <laughs> you know, be your late 30s El Hornet, not your late, late 20s El Hornet where you were like super... I was, I was just focused. I was like everything had to get done and I was pushing it. I was really intense about it and just chill out a little bit. But um, I think just let action speak rather than words and I had too many words. So talk <laughs> less and <laughs> chat less breeze on the internet. That would, that would be a definite one. Never register for any forum ever. Don't ever post a damn thing online. Oh, I can really suck you in. <laughs> I used to post on the Adelaide Drum and Bass Forums, Adelaide Massive. I've got to shout them. Um, I don't know if it still exists, but, yeah, you're getting heated discussions and, fuck you, man, you're tuned shit. And, yeah, it was pretty fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> and Melbourne Drum and Bass and Adelaide Massive, they were the two kind of Eastern vibe ones. Sydney, I don't even think had one. And yeah, in, right. in the mix forums. Oh, man, I was a fiend on them back in the day. <laughs> like, way before Pendulum kind of left, I was like, fuck you, fuck you. Yeah, it, was, it was pretty fun. <laughs> I wonder if there's anyone out there who's like, I got in an internet fight with El Horner before he became famous. Like, 
I hope so. Wear it like a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to ask uh, something of an inevitable question, I guess, but how is uh, the new music going that has been hinted at? I thought you were going to ask, where's Robin Gaz? Um, <laughs> it's early days. Mm -hmm. There's been some signs of life. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's pretty much all I'll say. For the last seven years, there hasn't been any signs of life. There is recent signs of life. So um, our old Rob Swire is a bit of a um, an oracle of sorts, and he he mm -hmm. swings to his own pendulum, so to speak. Uh. So hey, hey, ding ding. So when the planets align and it's the right time, that that will sort of happen. But he's okay. um, he's into it, and it's taken a long time to get to that point. So yeah, signs of life. In terms of process, um, I guess I'm interested in how making music is different for you compared to when you first started. When we first started, we actually had the ability to be in the same place at the same time and work on stuff. And we would go and we would do sessions in in Perth and um, or when we first moved to London because we were living together. And then it became um, a point where we just kind of had to let that that kind of collaborative, creative process sort of subside a little bit in favour of letting Rob just do what he had to do because I found that when all three of us were in the room we would work on stuff for a day or four and then we would leave myself and Gareth and then Rob would change everything we'd done and I could never disagree with how he'd changed it so there were still elements of what we'd started sort of um, brainstorming or had worked but that's what he's on this planet for is to make this music and so if he'd taken a song in a direction that we'd started together I could never disagree with it ever it's happened once and then I questioned something he'd done on our like our first tune and then I watched it how it worked in the club and I was like oh you win <laughs> so now it's quite different but um, I think after three albums after 13 or 14 years I think um, we've kind of all chilled a little bit mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be such a control trip so you can actually be a bit more um, open and a bit more sharing of what each of us is working on whereas before it'd be quite hard to even you know all sit in a room together and work on stuff there was a period where we just left him to it and I think we've come full circle and we've got a bit older and um, moving forward I think it'll be a more collaborative effort where we actually get down and seriously make some music together like we used to rather than just all coming with our little bits and throwing it in the pile. I hope. <laughs> I look forward to it. What is a time in your career, um, personally, that you found really challenging and how did you overcome that? Um, yeah, probably when we moved to England. Um, Rob and I moved first in September 2003. Um, I'd done one tour before that for nine weeks where I played like eight or nine shows in Europe and America and came back with 300 bucks after nine weeks. I was like, yes. Spent all of it on a pie? Uh, it was like, yeah, a taxi in Perth, yeah. I was like, music money, <laughs> look, money from music. It was, it was a weird thing. So I literally sold my car, um, everything I owned, and we moved with a suitcase and 300 bucks each to London. And you're in your mid-20s and you're like... Everyone in Perth's going, you'll be back, you know, six months. Well, that was 14 years ago. So that period of time was, was um, terrifying because imagine you move to a city and you don't know how to freaking buy food or you don't have a bed and you're sleeping on the floor and you're like, what do I do? And how do I do things, you know? It's like, it's not, it's not an easy place to move to London. It's not like you, you move to Adelaide and you get a car and you drive down the shop and buy stuff and get in your car and drive home. You've got to figure out, like, the tube and, you know, just basic sort of shit I'm sort of remembering. But um, that was really quite scary because, on one hand, we had this huge world of drum and bass in front of us where everyone was like, you guys aren't like us, you're not from here. And then you had everyone home going, ha, ha, you'll be back. And you're like, shit, I really don't want to let either of them win. So it made us work really hard. Um, and we had no money at all. We had no gigs. Um, we had a record label run by Adam and Fresh. And they were kind of using that more to promote themselves than us. And it was like a really weird time period. So that kind of 2003 to 2006... Yeah, that's some, um, that's some grey areas right there because so much weird shit went on. I just chose to forget it and move on. <laughs> just blacked it out. We wrote a whole second album about being angry about those three years. So there you go. So we'll hit up the audience questions in just a sec. Uh, one 
thing that did come up repeatedly as we were sort of promoting this and talking about the fact that we were doing this is Tarantula. Lots mm. of people want to know about that song. How sure. did you go about making it? It's come up recently because I think I was I, I posted on Reddit at four in the morning after not sleeping for a day about it and said, this happened, this happened. And, um, yeah, I guess we'd written it um, in part because I've got a couple of demos of it that just have Spider's vocals on it because we recorded him. And then we found – we were living in Fresh, DJ Fresh's flat in London and we found a CD of recorded vocals which were from a tune called More Fire which had come out, I don't know, a year or so before. Had a bun- bunch of other MCs on it. Um, I knew about Tenafly, the vocalist, because of his um, work with Congo Natty, like a jungle sort of label. And I, I heard his bit and we just sort of took it out. And If you listen to the phrasing of the, the song, it makes absolutely no sense at all. Like the – there's two MCs and they what they're saying don't correlate whatsoever to each other. So I used to always think, why does the people like this song so much? <laughs> and that was pretty much one of the first songs that broke Pendulum was that and Slam started getting played on, um, on Radio 1 in the UK in the middle of the day. And I was like, what? <laughs> it starts off with him talking about going to a funeral and kicking dirt on the grave and then drinking all the alcohol at the wake. And then another guy comes in and says, Tarantula. And you're like, what the hell does that have to do with the first bit? It hasn't got anything to do with it at all. So it was more like um, a mishmash of two different vocals that we came up with, which we didn't take that seriously, and then suddenly the tune is going crazy. So I'm sure if you smoked enough of something, you'd be able to work yeah. out a hidden meaning. <laughs> yeah, it's such a trippy tune. I think it's just maybe the key and the, it's got some deep subconscious thing about it that, that makes it... You know, like I have 18-year-olds come up to me and just go, mental, that tune, that tune. I was like, you were six when we made that. What the hell? Like, <laughs> I can't think of many drum and bass tunes that were from that period, like 2005, that people that are 18 now would appreciate. It's, it's sort of like beyond, you know, out of their scope. So, uh, When you figure out why that tune got so big, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely will. Uh, I think we might move to a couple of questions from people who are in here. Talia has a microphone. We're recording all of this and, and podcasting it and stuff. So if you've got a question, raise your hand. We'll pass you the mic and we'll go from there. Cheers. Is that working? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming in. No worries, man. Um, I guess I was mostly curious about, you sort of alluded to it already, like just in terms of um, like the actual production of the songs. So by the sounds of it, Rob was sort of mostly in charge. Cause yeah, when we first started, it became apparent very quickly that even though all three of us were engineering music, he was on this different trajectory than, than what we were. Um, I've got super early demos that, hopefully no one will ever hear from 2002 and you could hear where he was headed versus where Gareth and I were headed musically and I think Gareth and I were on path about the same and before we made a tune all together Gareth and I made two tunes Um, one was called The Dog and the other was called The Fist I've never told anyone that and then we went in (laughs) then we went in and made tunes with Rob and I'd I'd listened to what he was making Um, he'd recorded some bands and done remixes of them for fun and I was like yeah, we're here and he's sort of heading off over that way. And he was at the West Australian Conservatory Music um, studying and we made some tunes and he took them in, played them to his instructor and his instructor said, how did you make that? And he's like, fuck you, I quit. Because if you can't tell me how I made that, what are you going to teach me? And he's, he was literally, you know, anything you've ever been involved in as a hobby or whatever, he was a million times more into sound design and production than that. And I was into surfing and skating and punk rock. So, you know, you had to let him run with that. And so the production process definitely um, involved letting him run wild. And then he'd turn around after two days of being awake and be like, I made this. And you'd be like, we need to change this and that. But, yeah, it's cool. So that was kind of how it started uh, early days. Now I just let him get on with it. Like, you know, don't question him. He's a, he's a bloody ninja. It's amazing. <laughs> Anyone else got a question for El Hornet? Um, what influenced you guys in the early stages slash days? Uh, from drum and bass or in general? Well, have both. Okay, drum and bass, uh, Stacker and Skynet, Conflict, uh, Bad Company. Bad Company were kind of the first drum and bass group to, you know, to actually be a, a collective and to, um, to sort of spin people out so much. Like I remember watching them and just being so completely blown away by what they'd done and... Three albums, they got 
a little silly towards the end, but the first two were sort of ridiculous. And um, Rob and Gaz were in a metal band. I was in a punk band. So we were kind of listening to a lot of um, Tool, a lot of prog, um, a lot of metal. And um, those sort of found our way into the tunes. Like uh, we did a tune called Another Planet and there's a drum roll in it, which is from Megadeth. And I sampled it. No one ever figured out where it was from. I was waiting for the lawsuit. But um, <laughs> 13 years ago now, so got the way with that. But, yeah, it was definitely um, – I think progressive rock had a lot of a lot of play with Pendulum. Um, if you look at the lyrical content, a lot of the weird shit going on in the background is um, probably based on that rather than jungle. Yeah. I reckon we've got time for maybe two more. So raise your hand. Uh, Ryan? Cheers. Um, you said you were working, maybe working on new music, sort of. Would you consider doing the band thing again? We're in the middle of a tour. <laughs> no, like the, the Pendulum oh, band. Like Pendulum Live yeah. as a band. Yeah. We're in the middle of a tour. <laughs> They're doing 14 shows this summer and they've done seven already. I really like the idea that you guys can be in multiple places at once. Like, you're over here doing the DJ set and they could be off doing, like, a live show and yeah. no one would know the difference. Um, yeah, they started, I guess, a month and a half ago doing live shows in Europe for the first time since 2010. So we did NAS Festival in the UK. We're doing SW4 in August. Um, they did a few throughout Europe, kind of your second tier European festivals rather than the big massive ones, but... Um, Back to what we did before, we where we would play our set at a at a rock festival. Um, In Flames were on one that we just played at, and they were playing at the same fucking time as we were on. We wanted to get Anders on stage and do like self versus self again for the first time since that album came out, but it didn't quite work out. But I think we were sandwiched between Slayer and someone else. So the live show is back and it's on the road. Um, and yeah, I think there's seven more shows booked this year, and there was some noise about maybe coming to Australia in the next 12 months, hopefully. Reckon we'll see any shows out here in the bush? <laughs> <laughs> well, Adelaide was, um, for Pendulum, has been such a huge inspirational place. Like, um, I signed our breakthrough tune, Vault, I signed when I was in Adelaide. Uh, I was at, I can't remember, I, was, I played a gig at a club called Traffic here that doesn't exist anymore. And I was on the internet at three in the morning and was talking on AIM Messenger to Doc Scott, who owned the label, and he agreed to release that tune and I was... Like, that happened in Adelaide. I got so excited, I got up and ran around the block at four in the morning, like, four times. It's got, cause no one, I couldn't ring anyone and tell them. But um, Adelaide's always on the map because that used to be the biggest place in Australia other than Perth for Pendulum. We must have done 30 shows here, I reckon, like, like individually and then together and then we played live. So um, maybe generationally, like, we're a bit old and people don't realise that, but Adelaide's, you know, was like our second home, so... We have to come back and play here one day. All right. Go us. Uh, one more question. Raise your hands. Uh, How do you decide? <laughs> yep. Uh, with the hair. The person My with the hair. My failed me. Come in. Um, hello. I was wondering if you were ever going to do another live collaboration with Prodigy. Hmm. We have a studio um, two floors down from their studio, so never say never. They... <laughs> They'd have to make better music for a little while first. <laughs> Shots fired. Ooh, shade. Everyone um, that's my age wants the prodigy to make music like they made when I was 18. Um, I don't know anyone who goes to a prodigy show to hear Warriors dance. You know, they should make some rave music again. Them, I don't know. I'd be stoked. I don't know if that will have any impact on us making a tune with them, but it would be cool. Because <laughs> there was a lot of beef. Uh, people used to think we had beef with them and there was drama and, and then we made that tune to kind of silence that. So there was never beef, there was never drama. It was just a bit of a bit of chat. But, yeah, I'd love to make a tune with them, definitely. Was, was that beef a result of that, again, Aussie honesty that people just weren't used to or do you think? I think they, um, they thought the prodigy were pissed off at Pendulum for taking their, their spot and going and playing Download Festival and other rock festivals and us being the electronic new version of The Prodigy. But we didn't care. Like, I'm, I, I, tr I tried to sneak into Berlin Nightclub in Perth in 1992 to watch The Prodigy play when I was in high school. And I stood out the front and every time the door would open and someone would come out, I'd be like, oh, shit, it's The Prodigy. So there was no beef, there was no drama. You know, Liam Howlett's an incredible um, musician. I don't know what the other two do, but... Um... <laughs> Shade. <laughs> um, 
I reckon we can squeeze one more in. So, raise your hands. He's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here for ages. Um, I'm just really interested in why you think uh, Pendulum has had such longevity. Like, it's, there was a big, yeah. it's been a big buzz. Like, we knew you guys were coming. Isn't it weird? It, yeah. I mean, I think because it was so different, and I think of the impact that those records had. Um, you could kind of say the same thing. Um, I would never put myself in, in the league of people like, like the Chemical Brothers, but it's a similar league. You can't deny it. Like, it had that same impact of when our records came out, the same thing with, with them. And you can kind of, um, once you've done that, you can kind of bank on it. If you want to keep going, you can keep going. And I think um, it just had, um, it had such a, an impact on such a wide cross-section of people rather than just the drum and bass scene. And we have fans who don't even know what drum and bass is. They're listening to it, but they're not sure that that's what it is. And that's cool. Like, so I think um, it, it reached so wide and it was so embraced by such a wide cross-section of um, people and media. Um, and I think that's why it carried on for so long. I never thought I'd still be here, honestly. I thought get an album out of the way and then I'd be building gazebos or something, you know. <laughs> or working on a farm again, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I reckon we might wrap that up. Thank you guys so much for coming and thank you for chatting to us. No it's worries. huge. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you for turning out. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>